library. She's new to the library, although she, she's worked in the university for a number of years, primarily in the Faculty of Education and Language Studies. She will talk about improving the discoverability of learning materials with linked data, please. Firstly, I'm left-handed, so I find <laughs> using a strange laptop very challenging. Oh, excuse me one second. There we go. <clears throat> well, hello, everyone. Um, as Roy said, I'm from the Open University, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project we've wor been working on um, for the last few months. It's a small experimental project, and what we've been trying to do is discover if we can improve the discoverability of our old learning materials. So these are materials from courses that we're no longer teaching. I'm going to take you through a little bit about our approach, some of our findings, and some of the outputs we've made from the project. I'm not going to be terribly technical, but hopefully what I tell you will give you a flavor of all the different types of work that have been involved. <coughs> so for those of you who are not familiar with the Open University, we are a distance learning um, university based in the UK. And we have a, a very clear mission, and that is that we want to be open to people, to places, to methods, and ideas. And the key thing about being open to people is we've no restrictions on who can study with us. People don't have to have any previous um, higher education experience or academic qualifications to register on our modules or our courses. Having said that we're a distance learning organization, we do have a model that we call supported open learning. So although people might be studying from home um, in their own time, they do get support. They get support from tutors or online forums that are linked to their modules. There are actually study facilities and student advisors based in their geographical region. And we do encourage them to make contact with other students, whether that's through tutorials or day schools, and these might be face-to-face, -face, but they might equally and increasingly be online. We also encourage a lot of uh, use of social media now to make those contacts both formally and informally with other students. <coughs> As I say, we're based in Milton Keynes, which is a little way north of London, but we do have regional centres across England and national centres in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales in the UK. A very quick history for you there. About 40 years ago, in 1971, we were established and welcomed our first students over the virtual threshold. And since that time, in the last 40 years, obviously we've been continually innovating and looking at ways we can use new technology to support our students and deliver our teaching to those students. And obviously, those technologies also support our openness mission. So recently, of course, we've made use of iTunes U and put lots of our materials up there for free use and access. And we have an open learn site where, again, people can freely access chunks of our learning materials. Today, in terms of student numbers, the Open University is the largest academic institution in the UK. We've got around 240,000 students. <coughs> Many of those are based in the United Kingdom, but we do have significant numbers in Europe and from the rest of the world. And we try to encourage students from the widest possible range of backgrounds. In the past, we had a lot of older students, but now with students of all ages, that's much more widely and broadly spread. We also have a large proportion of our students have disabilities, and obviously the distance learning model really might suit their circumstances. We try to encourage and provide opportunities for students from lower incomes, and with that in mind, a great number of our students are working, so they study um, often part-time while they're working full-time or part-time themselves. And as you can imagine, over the last 40 years in distance learning, teaching and learning has transformed itself. And Merrily so, my son do a little bit, but uh, we are uh, obviously very focused on MOOCs now, and uh, FutureLearn was set up, as we said, um, er, to in, 
in the last year, and a number of organisations are in partnership, not just academic organisations like the OU, but organisations like the British Council, the British Library, um, in order to provide a range of these open, online, freely accessible courses. So if you can imagine with all those different styles of teaching at a distance, we do have a rich collection of um, archived learning materials in a variety of different formats, not just digital. But increasingly, we are trying to preserve those in a digital format. And that brings me on to the OU Digital Library, or the OUDL. We've got an acronym for everything that begins with OU. Um, and that is obviously a key repository for those old learning materials. And it's not just materials, as I say, that were born digital, like our course websites that we have now, but the older materials way back from the 70s. So print materials that were sent out by post to students, videos, radio programs that were broadcast to support our teaching. And those um, are being preserved along with other things that are important to the history of the OU in the digital library. So things like recordings of keynote speeches from vice chancellors and images. And although it's still in development, the OUDL, we are planning to launch it publicly very soon. For those of you that are interested, um, the, we are building it using Fedora, and obviously that is um, supported by the Digital Preservation community and allows us to use internationally supported metadata standards and these are very important in the OUDL. And what that means is we can have um, excellent searches, um, we can do full text searching on our stored print materials and also on the transcripts of those video and audio materials. So with the OUDL in mind, Stellar Project um, was set up in 2012. <coughs> and I don't know what came first, the acronym or the name, but uh, the, the project name stands for Semantic Technologies Enhancing the Life Cycle of Learning Resources. So how can we use semantic technologies to, to better improve the life cycle of those old materials? <coughs> it is an 18 month project. We're funded by DIFF and it's been run by the library in Lewisham University. Having said that, uh, we are working very closely with our own semantic web experts in our Knowledge Media Institute uh, of PMI. We're part of a wider program that DISC are running, and that's looking at the whole sustainability of digital collections. Uh, there's other projects in that strand being run by other institutions. So, for example, ones looking at the UK Web Archive <coughs> or digital libraries and other organisations. And we are coming to the end of our little project. We are due to wrap up towards the end of July 2013. So what are the project's objectives? Obviously, we've got these collections I've mentioned in the OUDL. And the Stella project was set up to, firstly, try and understand is there actually a value to keeping old learning materials? Um, and to do this, we wanted to talk to key stakeholders across the university who were involved perhaps in using them or creating them at one time. Once we had that understanding, we wanted to experiment with some of those uh, collections and see if we could enhance the value, perhaps by using some semantic technologies. <coughs> Obviously, that would help us understand if this was even a sustainable approach. Would we want to do this to learning materials in the future? Would we, in fact, consider developing our digital library to hold those old learning materials? Would we be able to provide evidence that that was a good thing to do? And finally, obviously, we do want to go down that route. We need a model to look after, to manage the life cycle of these materials, and if possible, to increase any return of investment on preserving them. So as I say, the first thing we had to do was try and measure that value that people placed in our own old materials. <coughs> and we did this through both a survey and one-to-one -one interviews with academics and other stakeholders from the Open University. And we tried to ask them about different types of value those materials might have. So obviously this is a financial value. Do they have an actual monetary value in themselves? But also, did people <coughs> feel that professionally or personally, there was value from keeping those materials, particularly, obviously, if they had been involved in their creation. We also questioned the historical value of these materials. Did they tell us something about the 
history of higher education, about systems learning, about our university, and did they actually boost our own reputation within that community? <coughs> and finally, very practically, we said, is there a value to our own internal processes for keeping these materials? Um, Sorry, particularly in the process of producing new or rewriting course materials, should they be reused in that fashion? <coughs> we also, one further question asked them was, how long should we keep them if we do? Um, and one interesting message that came through clearly through this survey and other research we've done since is that, particularly relating to those processes, academics really wanted to reuse um, course materials as part of their ongoing course production processes, but they found it in the Open University certainly very difficult sometimes to find the material. They knew it was out there somewhere, they wanted to reuse it, but, but in our systems it was really hard to pinpoint it or retrieve it. So what we were hoping is using semantic um, web technologies, we could, by looking for meanings rather than specific documents, we make that a bit easier for them. So that's just, this is just a quick summary of what we heard. Um, the survey was generated 561 responses, which was really actually very, very good response rate, we felt. And there's some of the headlines. So nearly 90% of people thought we should keep an archive of old materials, and this was important to our reputation as a university. And many, many people thought that should be kept indefinitely. Again, 90% or so thought it was very important keep these because they told us something about the history of higher education. And finally, those people who are involved in course production, in writing materials, felt that they would be likely to turn to old materials either for inspiration or for reuse when they were doing work in that area. But as I say, caveated by the, the thought that this was not the easiest thing to do practically. So that was our first step very much of information gathering. And secondly, we had, had a phase we called enhancement. These are just, a, I'll go into a bit more detail, but the uh, steps we went through in the enhancement phase. So we took the survey feedback and selected three collections that we wanted to experiment on. And these collections were, as I say, old courses um, from the Open University. We selected a Science Foundation course, and that was first in 1971, um, a course around issues and deafness, and a third course um, around business in English. And given the age and the style of these courses, we did find there was a large amount of different types of materials um, involved with print and audiovisual items. <coughs> so what we needed to do was get digital versions of those where we didn't have them already and store them in the OEGL. And we took a decision to do something we'd never done before, which um, was to digitize a whole course. So previously, we might have digitized print materials, so course books, and we also digitized video and audio material. But we'd never looked at all the other stuff that goes out to students that builds up their experience of a course. So they get things like assessment papers, specimen exam papers, if they're doing the science course, they got notes to go with their home experiment kits. They got updates, so if changed, if I made the course materials or errors were discovered in course materials, they got paper updates. And this has built the whole picture of the course. So we decided, yes, as part of our experiment, we'll digitize all that stuff. Um, and it was a lot of stuff. Um, and of course, because we'd never done anything with that before, we hadn't cataloged it before, we didn't have metadata for it. So actually, we created a lot of work for ourselves. Um, and the next step was obviously to look at that. Um, in some cases where we did have metadata, that needed to be improved because it was quite some time ago um, that these courses were, were established. And finally, we did the enhancement and um, all the work with the linked data. <coughs> so I've touched on this already, but this gives you a flavor of what the, some of those materials might have even looked like. Um, as I say, we have books set books, but also some of the paper course guides from 1971 had been bound into hardback books, and that's all we had to start with. Um, obviously, we've got things like the papers. Cor uh, particularly for the, the science course, um, programs were broadcast on the BBC, so we had videotapes we had to digitize. 
we had programs that were broadcast on the radio, and we had cassette tapes of those with diagrams, and for the programs we had synopses, subtitles, transcripts, so a whole raft of materials, as I say. In order to make sense of that, one of the first things we did, um, well, I didn't, but people did, <laughs> was create a, a module profile, because not only were we describing stuff like books and that, which we've done in the past, but we had to describe the actual course itself, the module. And so this di diagram shows how all the components of a module might fit together. So you've got the module itself, which might have been delivered in a number of different years. We've got units, it might be broken down into units of study. Each unit might have had a study guide, a text, TMA, so that's a pupil marked assignments, um, assessment. And there might also be programs associated with the module or with the unit. And each, as I say, each of those had to be, would have subtitles, rights information, something else we had to try and collect um, and store. So this is, this gives you a picture of the complex set of data we we're working with and which we we're trying to link together and make more discoverable so it could be reused. We also tried to describe the relationships between all these uh, um, elements of the module and this uh, relationship model was developed as well. So again, similar components, obviously, but we see we tried to describe here how the, um, the assets were part of the module, the, um, the transcripts were related or part of, of the actual program itself. And so this model, as well as the profile, all had to be loaded into the OUPL. Now this bit of the presentation, I'm just gonna show you a couple of pictures of what was going on in Fedora. I'm no expert in this, and obviously um, I'm just gonna touch on it, but the slides will be made available so you can probably look at the detail yourselves um, afterwards if that's what you're interested in. But you can see we've got a picture of the Fedora record here for the module S100, which is that science course that we were talking about, and the three data streams within it. And what we've done is broken out the RDF from uh, that and tried to indicate what it relates to. So the Fedora record was then ingested and the triples were created, which allowed the um, content to be accessed either via Sparkle or the Fedora uh, search interface. We did have um, a data set around courses available, and this was the model um, before we even started Stella, but what we were able to do was add to that, give it a historical perspective. So <clears throat> what you can see is here we've got a, a model of telling us about A103, that's the course code, called an introduction to the humanities. And what Stella added is this version of element. So we can see that there was a previous version of A103, um, A102, and surprisingly enough, prior to that, there was A101. So again, we've given that extra layer of information so if people were interested in A103 now, we tend to be able to go and find out a previous version to see if there was things in that course earlier that we could be of use. Finally, we needed to actually show people what we'd done because our question we had to answer was have we increased the value of those materials in any way? So our Knowledge Media Institute um, have developed a prototype tool, very much a prototype, to allow us to search the linked data representations that we have in the digital library for that content. <coughs> very simply, we enter text into a tool. Um, it's passed through a, a semantic meaning engine that's matched against concepts um, in the digital library, and based on the meaning of that text, a selection of matches are displayed to the end user. They can then take any of those if they're interested and go directly to the content as it's stored in the digital library. And obviously, you know, we talk about meaning here, and that's uh, how we're hoping to get over that hurdle of being able to access relevant content <laughs> more easily. And as you'll see, as well as going to the digital library, the tools allowing us to go to other data sets and retrieve information from those. I'm just gonna show you a screenshot here, which hopefully should give you an idea of what the tool looks like, and you know, it's very simple, and, and how it works. And we've been showing this to academics and, and other users across the university now. Um, so in the top box, text is entered by the user, and that can be pasted or typed in. 
bit of imagining an academic might be working on writing a course materials or an article, and if they wanted to search for something to help them or refer to, they could just copy that text they're working on straight into the tool. The user then just clicks the Discover tool. Um, the most feedback we've had is why can't we click enter, but uh, <laughs> discover at the moment. Um, and then based on the meaning of the text entered in the top box, the tool suggests matches from the content that we've been working on. <coughs> These can then be cl clicked on if you're interested in them, and that takes you straight through to the actual content itself. So we also have the opportunity to change the selection by using the sliders on the, on the left, which will change perhaps the relevance and give you a new selection to look at. And then you're taken to things like this. So this is a PDF that we have in the digital library, a, um, a scanned ver copy of a page from a postscript from that 1971 science course. So the user could access that directly in the search as they want. Likewise, you might be taken to a video, a program that was broadcast in the 70s in support of that course. Um, we also are able to access the metadata from the tool, um, and that's held on a page called data.open.ac.uk. And it looks something like this. <coughs> so, a couple of examples there. We've got a course called Natural and Artificial Intelligence. You can see we've got data around, <coughs> excuse me, um, when the course <coughs> was presented, what its course code is, what the units are academic credits related to it, and further down, we're going into where it's available, so we ge where geographically you can study that course. We've also got data about course materials here, so a resource book from an introduction to humanities. We've got the date there, 2005, a description of the book, its title, and again, the subject that it covers. So that gives you an idea of the work we were doing, and we've now entered just recently, the evaluation phase. So we're going to have a look and ask people through surveys, through workshops, how do they find this tool? What do they think it might be used for? And how valuable might it be? And we're doing that with trying to, to touch the same group that we spoke to in the first survey so they can give us feedback on how we've moved forward. And we've got some feedback, but, but we're not finished yet, which, are, which is interesting. These are the sorts of questions we're asking them around whether they feel they're getting access to a broader range of materials through the tool which uses semantic analysis, whether they think they would therefore reuse the materials um, or are more likely to reuse the materials than they have been in the past. So again, emphasizing these are only provisional conclusions and uh, we, we um, are coming towards the end. The key, these are our findings. We know from the first survey that People do value these materials and feel they should be preserved. And if they're more accessible and discoverable, people will reuse them. They also feel that what they've seen so far, the semantic technologies, are enabling them to do that. And some, there is some agreement that that could have financial benefits for the university in the short term. Very quickly, lessons here, because Roy's uh, telling me the time. <coughs> but um, obviously, that was good findings. But you know, we learned some things along the way, the hard way. And what we found was the significant effort that we had to put in to improve the metadata for those materials we selected. And that really stemmed from the fact, as I say, we decided to get the most from our linked data. We wanted to digitize everything. And in order to do that and get them into the system and use it effectively, we had to spend time cataloging it as well, going right back to the start. So there is a trade-off there. There is also obviously effort involved in setting up the linked data, but we want to build that into our general practice. And we're already seeing the benefits of that ease of searching and the ability to link to other data sets. Based on what we've done in Stellar, you can see in our library now we're starting to link to, from learning materials like this program about art to external content in IT review. So that's it. It just remains for me to thank Jisk, who obviously has funded our project, and thank you all for listening. Are there any questions for the speaker? No? Then, thanks a lot.